Today we're gonna get into how to build a search engine like the big boys. And that means something like, you know, how does Google do it? Now, obviously we're not gonna build Google 2.0 in this video, but you are gonna learn how to do semantic search. So that means we are not searching a list of articles or text by, you know, kind of pressing control F and then searching through them by literal string match. No, that's not what we're gonna do. Instead, we're gonna do something way cooler and that is searching by meaning of the search query. So you enter a search query and the video you're gonna see that's gonna be politics or cars. And then we are looking through a list of articles and essentially finding out which meaning of the article matches the meaning of the search. It's gonna be really cool. You're gonna learn how to do this in practice. And in the future, we might build a whole search engine with this. So let's get into how this works and what this even looks like. So before we dive into the actual specifics of how this works in practice, let me show you how this works. So I got three statements right here and I just got them. If you take a look right here, I'm from some random Wikipedia articles. So one is about the Dutch Grand Prix in 1967. The other one is about some... Uh, award and then one more about some politician so the topics are kind of different and that's the whole point so we've got the first one which is uh, about some uh, mississippi senator the second one about the trophy or the award and then the second one about the 1967 dutch grand prix and these are the three statements that we're gonna vectorize so let's see what happens when i type or actually, let's enter the query first. So right now it says cars, right? But maybe we want to query something that has to do with politics. Okay, let's have that in there. And then the what, what's gonna happen now is I'm gonna write yarn dev, and then it's gonna find the most similar of these three statements that we have right here. So one is about, you know, kind of like a Mississippi senator. So that would probably be the most relevant that we're expecting. Then there's the annual reward and then the Dutch Grand Prix. So when I type yarn dev, we are vectorizing all of these three statements and then vectorizing this right here, politics. And then it says right here, most relevant statement, I hope you can see that. Frank Downer Barlow, blah, 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 was a democratic Mississippi state senator representing whatever he was representing, right? So it found the most relevant statement as the um, politician. Now, if we enter something like, you know, uh, cars, let's try that. So let's type, actually, let's clear the screen first and then yarn dev. Let's see what happens. So we are expecting that the third one would be returned because it is the most similar one. And we can see when we enter cars as the search query, then we get the world championship of the 1967 Dutch Grand Prix returned. Even though in this statement, it does not say cars once. So if I were to go into this document and search for cars, you can see it only appears once. So we are really searching by semantic meaning here and not by what is actually present in the article. And we can also take a look at the relevancy. So this article has a relevancy of 0 0.7688 and then a bunch of more stuff, but the first um, letters or numbers after the comma are definitely the most important ones. And we can also take a look at what the other ones are like. So for example, let's log out the similarities, uh, which is essentially a vector map. So we can see all the indices. Uh, so let me save that. Type yarn dev again. So we're starting the node server back up. And then we can see the similarities. So one of them has 0 0.76. You can see it's the one with a Dutch Grand P. And then the other ones are around 0 0.73. So they are definitely less relevant if you consider that this value is almost never lower than something like 0 0.6. I've never seen it past 0 0.6 or even 0 0.7. It's always kind of between 0 0.7 and 1. And now if we had the exact same statement, right? You might wonder what happens then. So let's copy this statement and it's going to be the exact same. So we are expecting one very clear outlier in the relevancy department, right? Because we're um, generating the exact same query. We would expect the relevancy to be 1 or at least very close to that. And as you can see, it is literally one because it is the exact same statement. And then the other ones are still around 0 0.73 or 0 0.72. And as you can see, there is a small um, volatility in there. It's not always the same because we are generating this with AI. And I think that's a very good um, break. So we can get into the actual 
how this works and how you can implement this yourself. So the first step to creating a vector engine like this is indexing everything that you want to have in your everything that you want to be searchable, uh, searchable essentially. So all of these three statements are searchable and then you would save them in a database. Now there are specific databases for this. So for example, a vector database you could use is called Pinecone, which is also recommended by the OpenAI um, guys. They recommend Pinecone, or at least they say you can use Pinecone, which is a database for vectorized search. So it's very fast and optimized for that, but that is just one alternative you can use. Essentially, we want to vectorize everything that we want to be searchable, and then we are actually vectorizing that. So for each statement that we have, or each article that you want to have searchable, um, we are awaiting a promise at all. So that means we are doing, it, doing this simultaneously. So everything will be indexed at the same time and we're not doing one after another, which would be very inefficient for a time. And then we are creating an embedding of this statement. Now the function for that is very simple. Essentially, we are just calling OpenAI that allow this. So we are calling the openai.create embedding and then the text embedding ADA2 with the input of text. And what we're doing is calling an embedding engine over at OpenAI. And they have recently released a really good one that is also very, very cheap. If you're wondering, vectorizing is actually really cheap. Um, and you can have about, uh, I, th I hope you can see it, um, with this engine we are using, the best one yet, we can um, index around 3000 pages per US dollar we pay for it, which is insane value. If you consider that everything we index, so those 3,000 pages for $1 are now semantically searchable if we vectorize one query and that's it. So that's really, really cheap for what we're getting and the performance is quite good. Um, so we are doing this through OpenAI. There are other methods you could use. I'm using this one. It's really convenient, really cheap and really good. And then we are just returning this vector back to the... Um, promise.all. Now, if you want to see what this looks like, we can log out a vector. So let's log out the vector one, for example. And let's run this again. And that's, that is really going to spam the console, but you're going to see what the vector looks like. And uh, as I explained in the beginning of the video, it's an array of a lot of numbers. So essentially, we're taking the text up here and then turning that into an array of about 1,500. Yeah, you can see it 1,436 more. This is like a hundred entries. So about 1,500 um, numbers that we have in the array ranging from like that are all around something with a zero, like negative, some positive and no, actually, yeah. Okay. Some are positive. Yes, they are, but most of them are negative. It doesn't really matter. Essentially, we're just turning these into long arrays of numbers and we're doing that for each statement and then also for the query so we can make them comparable. Now that you know what a vector looks like, um, let's get into the query vector. We are doing the same thing with that. So after turning all these statements into a vector, we're also vectorizing the query so that we can then compare them right here. And we're doing that by mapping over each vector. So each very long list of numbers in the array and then finding out the vector similarity and saving that in the similarities array. So essentially for each array item we have a number um, indicating how similar this statement right here or this statement or this statement is to the query vector that we have generated. And the way we do that is with a very simple function we get from math.js. And now I'm not gonna get into any specifics of math.js, that would be really boring, but essentially what we're doing is we're calculating the cosine similarity. And that way we can compare one very long array of numbers to another very long array of numbers and break this down to one value that is a number um, and that is the 0 0.7 or whatever you saw earlier. Um, I don't see it in the console right now, but you remember from earlier the 0 0.73 or whatever, that is the similarity returned right here. So the cosine similarity between those vectors. And then we can check if, and, and we can set the threshold or self. So everything that's below 0 0.6, for example, is completely irrelevant. So for example, let's have something really irrelevant right here. So Chinese characters copy paste. And let me just paste something in here um, that doesn't have to do with anything at all. Now this just means uh, copy paste. 
according to Google Translator. And now we should see one outlier in the in the relevancy department, right? So let me quickly adjust the console log we have right here to also include the text so that we can see which text has which relevancy. And so it's, it gets very clear that the Chinese characters are probably really irrelevant. So here we go. We can see the similarity scores and then we are mapping or looping through every single item in the array and then logging out the statement and its similarity. And if you remember, we have the Chinese one in the first index. So let's run this. And the query we are indexing is Frank Downer Barlow, blah, blah, blah. So something that has to do with politics. So one of the results should be very high because this is the exact same query as the state. Oh, never mind. We removed that statement. Never mind. Then one will be very irrelevant and the other ones are going to be somewhat relevant. Um, so let's see the results. And as you can see, the Chinese one that doesn't have to do anything with anything is 0.6. So that's still quite high, even though it's completely irrelevant. As you can see, that's what I meant earlier. It is still very high. And then the other ones are around 0.72 and 0.73. So they are also pretty irrelevant. So you, you would probably want to move this relevancy threshold up. And now if we try this again, or if in your application, the user enters a search term, um, we can see no relevant statements found because they are all under this threshold, meaning they are kind of really irrelevant. And that's all the magic there is to it. That's how you can do semantic indexing of your statements or of articles or of anything that you want to be searchable by meaning and not by actual text match. And then we can see we have a threshold and then, you know, we get the most relevant statements at the end, or if none is relevant, then none at all. And that's it. That's all there is about semantic search. Now, if you enjoyed this, build something cool with it and let me know. I'll probably open a community discord soon because so many people uh, suggested that. So you could share it there or you could share it in the comments if you actually build something cool with semantic search. And with that said, we might get into an actual search engine in the future. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one and bye bye.